In today's video, I'm going to show you how I built this outdoor decking for our new hot tub. There's a lot of chatter on the internet about whether you can put a hot tub on decking, but I didn't find a lot of information about how you can safely do this. And the problem for a lot of us is you've got existing decking you've had for a while that you now want to put a hot tub on, and that decking typically isn't designed to take the loads of a hot tub. And if it's anything like this, a four to seven person hot tub fully filled is going to weigh over a ton. So in today's video, I'm going to show you how over the course of seven days, a couple of weeks ago, I constructed this decking. And as this was my first attempt, as usual, I'll be passing on lessons learned and mistakes I made along the way. I've compiled a list of decking tips, which I'll be referring to during the course of the video. It's been a great way to create a new focal point in what was a neglected, unloved area of our garden. And the techniques I've used today could form the basis of a day room or a garden shed. So let's have a look at the tools I use in the construction. We've got this wheelbarrow with its puncture-proof wheel, bought from my local farm supply store. Pick and mattock with a seven pound head and pickaxe handle for excavating and leveling the area. Post digger, borrowed from my father-in-law. An ancient tool that featured heavily on my fence construction video. Spade for shifting soil during the groundworks and digging the footings. A gorilla wrecking bar for breaking up soil in the footings and loosening stones and other debris. Line marker spray for marking the perimeter of the deck and the location of each footing. Dring for marking the joist positions and footing locations. Trowel for occasional use in the footings and adding cement to the sand and gravel mix. Remix quick setting post mix concrete. Six bags for the pergola posts. Sand and gravel, 16 25 kilogram bags for the footings. Cement, two bags to mix with the sand and gravel to create the footing concrete. Glazing packers to micro adjust the joist height prior to setting the footings. Decking screws, eight by two and a half inch to screw the decking down. Six by 120 millimeter screws to fix the joist to the external framework. Five by 100 millimeter screws for the noggins. I initially applied damp proof course to the underside of the joist. This was a massive error and I'll come on to why in a bit. Five meters of weed matting. 36 inch Owen quick grip clamps, eight bags of Forest of Dean gravel, 3.6 meter by 35 millimeter decking, Yorkshire board or gravel board, six by one inch for the retaining wall at the back, six by two inch tantalized sawn timber in 3.6 meter lengths for the joists, four by four inch posts, again tantalized, nine foot long for the pergola, single bevel sliding mitre saw to carry out the majority of the cutting, although a universal saw like this would suffice, but take a little longer. A workbench and two saw horses, my trusty Erbauer impact driver, some old bricks and a soil tamper. I use this old piece of lintel, but you can also buy actual soil tampers online. There'll be other things like these gloves, but fear not as ever, details of all today's tools will be in the description below the video. And in case you're wondering, the main elements in the build came to £632. We were putting the decking in an overgrown, unloved area at the bottom of the garden. So the first job was to clear up 10 years of vegetation and general rubbish that had built up down there. First up, I had to trim back the hedge for which I used my excellent steel KM56RC with a long ridge hedge trimmer crank arm combi tool. I've got a fair few hedges here and I don't know what I'd do without this tool. The bricks that I've dug up around the garden over the years, or otherwise salvaged from earlier projects, were then tidied up with a bolster and hammer and then moved, the intention being to reuse some of these for the decking footings. Day two and the groundwork continued, this time with leveling off or lowering of much of the area where the decking was going. Now, I spent a couple of sleepless nights wondering how I was gonna do this, but with no diggers readily available and having to remove a section of fence to get the digger in anyway, I thought I'd do it myself and I enlisted the help of this pick and mattock. And I've gotta say, if you've got a serious amount of digging, excavating work to do, you've got to invest in one of these because it's infinitely easier to use than a spade. But even so, it was the best part of a day's backbreaking work to hack up and remove by wheelbarrow most of that soil. And the other tool I couldn't do without on jobs like this is my 18 volt electric chainsaw, which is great for dirty little jobs like removing stubborn roots from the path of my excavation. 
It's day three, the build commences, and the first job of the day is to build a retaining wall out of Yorkshire or gravel boards to keep the raised bank below the hedge away from the decking. I improvised some posts from some three by two inch tantalized sawn timber I had left over from a previous job and set these in postcrete. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but suffice to say, setting each of the five posts in postcrete and angling the post so the long three inch section is taking the weight of the bank has created an immovable retaining structure. For the decking design itself, I really like the idea of having a decking fascia running around the outside so that no sawn edges of the decking itself are showing. This is probably controversial, and let me know if you think it is in the comments section below. Because by encapsulating the decking within the fascia, rainwater isn't going to drain off the deck and will instead be diverted inside the deck structure itself. I don't think this is a major problem given the way I've treated the substructure with bitumen and drilled holes in the fascia boards that you can't see at the side of the deck to assist with runoff, but undoubtedly next time I make one of these I will be putting the fascia boards underneath the deck to maximise the chances of runoff. So we can start using the decking as quickly as possible before the British summer breaks. I thought I'd incorporate pergola posts into the deck, the idea being to finish off the pergola later on in the year, modelled on some sort of modern design like this. I've never made anything like this before, so I was indebted to my carpenter mate John for inviting me around when he was building his garden shed to show me the methodology for his foundations. In my case though, to take the considerable weight of the hot tub, I've scaled up to six by two joists. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that this is not graded timber. I was kind of using what I could get hold of during lockdown, and after all this is only a low level deck, and I'll come on to in a minute how I've over-engineered the deck as it is to make it stronger than it needs to be. But particularly if you're building a raised deck, you, you're going to want to use C16 or C24 graded timber as a minimum, and this may also be a building regs requirement. So as my timber is not C24 graded, I've maximised the strength of the substructure with 12 inch or 305 mm centres between each joist, and a maximum span of 800 mm between each foundation pad supporting the joist. Obviously the size you make your deck to will depend on the space you've got available, but I decided to maximise the 3.6 metre length along this front section you can see behind me, with the side sections not quite so long at 3315 millimetres. And it's a good idea to use a string line and some line marker spray to mark out the perimeter of your deck. And so we're on to day four, and I thought I'd start by setting in concrete the pergola posts and then constructing the subframe around them. To get the top of the post horizontal, the plan was to dig the first hole at the lowest point and then temporarily screw the deck fascia to each post exactly 2270 millimetres down from the top. And by ensuring the decking fascia was spirit level horizontal before setting the post in concrete, so would the top of each post be for when we later construct the pergola. And this perimeter of decking, mitered in the corners, also enabled me to set the pace in exactly the right position, although if I'm honest the deck was slightly off square, so mark your pace and carefully measure the diagonals, and if these diagonals are exactly the same length, you know your deck is completely square. These 4x4 four four inch posts are only 9 foot long, and to maximise the height of the posts above deck, and I've ended up with just over 2.2 metres, I've limited the depth of the pergola post holes to 350 millimetres. You see some pergola contractors talking about 450 millimetre deep pergola holes. And if I was constructing a fence like this, I'd probably go all the way down to 600 mil. But I'm very happy with 350 millimetres for this project. It's incredibly sturdy. And while a lot of pergola contractors recommend six inch square posts, these will be absolutely fine for my intended purpose. For the corner posts, I used Remix Post Mix Concrete because it's quick setting, setting in about 10 minutes, which gives you just long enough to set the post in position and check the levels before it starts going off. Because it's set so quickly, you don't have to worry about supporting each post, except in a cursory way like I did here with a piece of wood and a spade, just whilst I poured in the cement. You aim to fill the hole half full of water and then pull the concrete in on top until it comes up above the water. Then use a stick with a reasonably wide base to mix the concrete with the water and to ensure there aren't any pockets the water hasn't got into. I often add more water and concrete until I'm happy with the level and the consistency of the mix, as you want to aim for a nice firm mix. Where possible you want to dome your concrete to minimise any standing water around that post. 
It was a bit tricky for me given proximity to the external fascia, but what I did do is I creosoted the bottom of the post where it met the concrete to give it as much protection as possible. What I love about this post creep is you can just tap it until you get your posts beautifully plumb. Like this look, and it just doesn't move once you've done it. And before you're too critical about the pointing of the shed, this is not my work. I inherited it when I bought the house and it's another job I've got to sort out at some point, as is this guttering. Days five and six were taken up with digging the footings for the substructure, namely the external and internal or intermediate joists. So why do you need to dig holes to support these joists? Well, these footings serve a few purposes. Firstly, they provide a firm structure or base for the joists. But secondly, by being raised, they keep the joists off the earth, which is important to maximize the chance of the joist drying out after a downpour and therefore preventing it or minimizing the chances of it rotting. And also by building up a mound of aggregate, which is a sand, cement and gravel mix with a brick on top, I was able to gently tap the joist down onto that brick, making micro adjustments to ensure the joist was completely level. So yes, I was obsessed about making sure my deck was completely level. And this is possibly one of the main mistakes I've made in this build. I was so careful about this that pretty much wherever you place the spirit level around the deck, you get a perfectly level reading. And whilst you'd think it would be the holy grail to have anything with water in it, like a hot tub on a level deck or concrete slab, I suspect I've committed one of the cardinal sins of decking by not allowing a slight gradient for the water to run off. As it happens, the deck seems to be draining pretty well at the moment, but time will tell. We'll check back in a year's time to see how the deck is faring and let me know what you think about whether a deck for hot tubs should be level or not in the comment section below. If you're wondering why I didn't use a quick setting postcrete, on the joist footings, there's a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's more expensive at £4.98 per bag compared to £3 for the much larger 25 kilogram sand and gravel bag. Also, I would have found the 10 minute setting time too quick for the process of leveling my joists. To mix the aggregate sand and gravel together, for small quantities like this, I tend to use my wheelbarrow typically aiming for a bag and a half of sand and gravel. I use a mix of four parts sand and gravel to one part cement. And with a five kilogram bag of sand and gravel, approximately 48 trowel loads, that means I need 12 trowel loads of cement per bag. I start by dry mixing the cement into the sand and gravel and then add water. The amount of water you add determines the consistency of the mix and is something you learn through trial and error. Suffice to say you want a mix that isn't too stiff but not so watery it can't support a brick. Digging was difficult as after years of conifer growth the soil was near the hedge still very fine and dry. Too much for my fence post digger to excavate. So digging each hole was a combination of by hand, spade and with the additional use of my gorilla bar to loosen the many large stones and glass fragments that littered the soil. I didn't dig very deep holes, probably only 200 millimeters deep, but ensured that they were well tamped down with, an, with the old concrete lintel that featured in a previous video. Remember, if you're building a raised deck using posts rather than these brick footings, you'll almost certainly need to go deeper, more like a 450 mil. Different rules apply and so seek professional advice before proceeding. I started by supporting the external 6x2 boards that run the perimeter of the deck to which the decking sides are screwed with each footing spaced 800 millimeters apart. You could say this is overkill as most of the weight will be borne by the internal joists but I thought I'd start as I meant to go on. With the external 6x2 framework in place I then progressed to the internal joists again supporting each joist with a footing dug approximately 800 millimeters away from the last and with the soil close to the hedge so fine I decided to stagger the holes from one joist to the next as otherwise with the 12 inch centers the holes would have been too close together and would have fallen in on each other and I used a string line with my trusty line marker spray to mark the position of each hole as I slowly, painstakingly dug and concreted the footings for each deck joist. Now you'll have noticed I stapled DPC damp proof course to the underside of the joist. Honest answer is I don't know what I was thinking. This is fine for a shed as you're preventing moisture rising from below into the joist, but it's hopeless for decking where the majority of the water is attacking from above. The DPC almost immediately started collecting water like a trough and so I hastily removed it before any damage was done. 
Going back to my weatherproofing tips for a minute, even on a low level deck like mine, you want to have the joists raised off the ground to help them dry out after rain. Taking this a step further, after removing the DPC, I decided to take the additional step of coating the entire substructure with this bitumen based waterproofing black paint. And even with tantalized timber like mine, you want the bitumen to cover the entire joist, including cut edges and the underside. Annoyingly, because I decided to creosote so late on, I didn't creosote the underside of the joist. But a little bit of contraction in the timbers, since I built the subframe, has enabled me to put glazing packers between the bricks and the joists, which should help to keep the brick moisture away from the timber after each downpour. The other step I took was to treat the underside of the deck itself, as it's this along with the top of each joist that's particularly susceptible to rotting. The other option to consider here would be to use composite decking, which isn't going to rot, but will be a lot more expensive than my decking, which came out at £9.42, including VAT, per 3.6 metre piece, or £244 for the entire deck, compared with the £80 to £100 per square metre you'll be paying for composite. I decided to copy my mate John's idea of spreading a weed matting under the deck to suppress any weeds that might grow up. Four metres cost me £9.60 and I laid this by folding it over each newly laid line of footings and cutting a hole for each brick. For a belt and braces approach to weed control and to make it as inhospitable as possible for rodents under your decking, you could spread gravel on top of this weed matting. I then repositioned the joist on the new line of footings and then secured it in position to the external joist frame with six by 120 millimeter screws. Some people would advocate using joist hangers, but for my purpose, I think this would be overkill given the sheer number of footings supporting both the external perimeter joist frame and the joist within. With a couple of internal joists in position, it was time to insert the supporting noggins. And considering my 3.3 meter span, I decided that two rows of noggins would be adequate, constructed from the same tantalized sawn six by two inch timber, but screwed in place with two slightly smaller five by 100 millimeter screws at each end of the noggin. The stiffening, strengthening effect of these noggins on the joists was quite remarkable. So early afternoon on day six, the substructure was complete and it was time to proceed with the final phase screwing down the decking. Again purchased from my local agricultural DIY yard. And as usual I've got a slight confession to make here. Because in a misguided attempt to keep the rain out of the substructure, I initially clamped the decking boards together tight up against each other with no gaps in between. When I removed the deck to get rid of the DPC a week or so later, I was shocked to find just how damp the substructure was and the underside of each decking board. So second time round I made four of these little decking spacers out of glazing packers so that I had a consistent five millimeter gap between each decking board to allow for expansion and to facilitate the efficient runoff of any rainwater. I could have gone wider but I didn't want to make it too easy for rodents to get underneath the deck. The other thing the gaps between the boards do obviously is increase air ventilation which helps to keep the substructure dry. And I've got a step further with my decking by introducing additional vents at the bottom of the fascia on the sides of the deck that you can't see using this stainless steel anti-rodent mesh. $9.99 for a pack of four, which is a bit of a bargain considering some bespoke grills cost 20 pounds each. The trickiest part was cutting the corner sections for the posts, but once this was done, it was full steam ahead, screwing down each Unifix eight by two and a half inch decking screw, which I attached to every other joist. Even with my new spacers, as the boards are not completely straight, I still needed to clamp each in position. And for this, I used my 36 inch Irwin quick grip clamps with the noggins conveniently positioned to clamp against. On the rare occasions I couldn't use the noggins to clamp against, I just screwed down a decking board temporarily and used this. And so it was on with the rest of the boards. I had to cut down the final board given the new spacings between each board. I cut the board down with a fence guide on my circular saw and a hammer crudely shoved in behind the cut to prevent the blade binding and draining the battery of the saw as it had done on previous occasions. With a bit of careful planning you should be able to size your deck so that you end on a full board. And all that remained was to spread the off-cut weed matting around the edge and pour in the forest of Dean gravel.
A couple of final steps involve turning some leftover bits of wood to good use to repurpose this old table that was about to go to the scrapyard and also adding some extra insulation below the hot tub with some insulation I had left over from a previous job which I made good around the edge with cloth or gaffer tape. Oh, and also buying this water butt at a subsidised price online from Seven Trent Water. We put this hot tub in to reward the children's patience in what has been a tricky summer what with lockdown and cancellation and cancelled holidays. For anyone wavering about whether to install one, I'd say go for it. I just wish I'd bought it earlier from Argos or B&Q rather than as I did on eBay at a vastly inflated price. We've been in it every day and also in the evenings thanks to this underwater LED I bought for £8 from Amazon. And what it does do is it brings a family together for valuable chats which happen so rarely these days given that everyone's glued to their tablets and smartphones. And I'm now an expert at measuring chlorine and pH levels. This is my first such decking project. If you're in the industry and you think I've got a load of things wrong let me know in the comments below but be kind. For the rest of us hopefully this will encourage some debate again in the comments section below on the pros and cons of putting a hot tub on decking. Obviously a concrete slab is a vastly superior platform for a hot tub but as you saw from the spirit level readings I took earlier this deck hasn't shifted a millimetre since I put this heavy lump on it a few weeks ago. If you've liked this video it'd be great if you could give it a thumbs up below and if you're new to my channel as I always say I would love to have you subscribe you can do that by clicking on the link here and don't forget to click on the bell notification icon so you get notified of future uploads. See you soon!